Thank you for that energy. Tonight's lecture, I think might be a good one. I'm gonna work my hardest to make this work for you. And it's got some controversial content. There's the title of the lecture. It seems like a simple question. How did the Rocky Mountains form? Those are our biggest mountains in the entire continent. North America I'm talking about, and our biggest mountain range. How did the Rocky Mountains form? Now, I don't live in the Rocky Mountains. I went to graduate school in the Rocky Mountains, but that was just three years. So why am I the person to give this lecture on how the Rocky Mountains form? You'll see, I think, because I've been learning some things not only about the Rocky Mountain geology, but also the geology west of the Rocky Mountains here in the Pacific Northwest that is part of trying to answer this question. But I'm ahead of myself already. Let me start by saying, I teach Geology 101, and I have every quarter for 35 years. That's a long time now. Every, oh my God. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah. That's, that's my main gig. I teach 101, and I still enjoy it 35 years later. And the way I always teach it is the first half of the class, I ignore plate tectonics. It's kind of an unusual thing. We work on geologic time and different kinds of rocks and the rock cycle and global climate and, and uh, ice age floods and all these kind of passive type things. And then halfway through the class, we launch into some plate tectonics and suddenly things are coming to life and continents are moving and Pangea and everything else. And right there in the middle of that class, midway through the term, we have a lecture on plate boundaries and how mountains are formed. And we go around the globe and we talk about how certain mountains are formed and not all mountains are formed equally. So let's flip you around. Let's do a very, very quick version of that plate boundary lecture. Fast paced, ready, here we go. There are places in the world where in a side view, you have two big continental blocks. Here's the sun shining above them and they are moving towards each other and it's a collision. It's a convergent plate boundary. So these two continents are on two separate tectonic plates that are on a collision course. And these don't just gently kiss each other, they smash into each other. They create folded sedimentary rocks, they create dynamical thermal metamorphic rocks. They create some plutons in the middle. It's a non-volcanic mountain range and the best example worldwide of this convergent continent versus continent collision are the Himalayas. Mount Everest, the highest point above sea level here on this planet. This is the story for the Himalayas. Everybody's taking their notes. Himalayas, where is that? I don't know, I'll, I'll look it up. It's the subcontinent of India that's colliding with a bigger continent called Asia. Well, and and it, it's an active collision today. There are terrifying earthquakes that continue to happen at this boundary because of this ongoing collision. India against Asia. Geology 101. Oh, there's other kinds of mountains in the planet? Really? They're volcanoes? That's right. Okay, well, we need a different picture for that. I think everybody in this room knows this, but I'm just reporting on what the basic, most basic, most basic, why well, say that three times? Picture is for different kinds of major mountain ranges around the world. Okay, now this next picture, we have an ocean next to a continent. We still have a collision, these are arrows. This is ocean floor that's subducting or diving beneath the continent. Magma is generated in that subduction zone and we create a volcanic arc a line of beautiful stratovolcanoes, one after another down the west coast of South America. Anybody know the name of the mountain range? Silence in the room, they're Americans. Okay, fine. It's the Andes, it's the Andes Mountains. Oh, okay. Andy. Good, good. It's also possible to create a mountain range completely underwater with the plates going away from each other. That's a divergent plate boundary. This is water, this is sea level, here's a boat. <laughs> and the Mid-Atlantic Ridge or the East Pacific Rise are the result of that sort of tectonic situation. That's the core of the lecture. Boom, 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 three different ways to make mountains. And usually a hand goes up about the time we're wrapping up or maybe they come up after class and it's usually a good student. And they say, I think you forgot about the Rocky Mountains, didn't you? I kept waiting for you to talk about the Rockies. And I'm like, I didn't forget about the Rockies. 
Uh, I purposely didn't talk about the Rocky Mountains today, young lady. We have to wait till the last week of the course to talk about the Rocky Mountains. And there's always a weird, confused look, like why? You were just talking about all these major mountains. Our biggest mountain range, the Rocky Mountains, North America, which one do I pick? And I say, we're not ready, it's complicated. <laughs> and it is complicated. And that's what we're gonna lean into tonight. And it's more than complicated, it's controversial. There's a question mark in the title of the lecture tonight. That's on purpose. And if somebody's watching this lecture right now and maybe they teach geology, they go, well, there's, there's no controversy. I teach how the Rocky Mountains form. Hasn't this, guy, hasn't this guy heard about the Farallon Plate subducting beneath California and then it changes its subduction angle and creates the Rocky Mountains? That's obviously what the story is. That's what I teach. That's what's in all these books. That's the company line. That's the main story. That's the majority opinion. And tonight, I'm not trying to make enemies now, but tonight we're going to look at some old evidence that's been ignored for 55 years, paleomagnetism. We're going to look at some new data from the last 15 years that is new enough that people aren't really understanding the significance of it. Mantle tomography. And that data... I think, puts a serious question mark behind the conventional old story of how the Rocky Mountains form. And does that mean everybody's going to change the way they talk about Rocky Mountains forming? Probably not. Probably for the next 20, 30 years, they'll still be talking about the Farallon. But I wonder if the Farallon plate model, the old model, is the way to go based on the new data that we have. And personally, that last week of my 101, for the last 10 years, I've changed it. I don't teach the old model anymore. I teach a new model using this new data. That's what we're doing tonight. I hope you can see that's where we're headed. But it's a controversy. And if you talk to somebody about this after the lecture or whatever, uh, there's going to be difference of, of opinion about this sort of thing. I stumbled on that because apparently I can already see the problems when you start talking about this. Okay, well, let's go ahead and lay this out. What is the old model? And also, where are we talking about? Let's say we have some viewers from a long way away that are not really sure where the Rocky Mountains are in North America. Let's do that first. Let's do that first. So here's Yukon Territory, Northwest Territories, British Columbia and Alberta. Here's the border with the United States, the lower 48 states, and then Mexico's down here. Hand-drawn map, not totally accurate, good. Oh, the Rockies are complicated? We have to wait till the last week of the class? That's right. Just within the Rocky Mountains, there's different signatures. There's different kinds of basic geology, like what? Okay, well, over in Colorado, I'm gonna draw a bunch of red circles. I'm gonna bring these red circles up into Wyoming and maybe a little bit of this part of Montana as well. Those are called block uplifts. The Laramide, I'll, I'll write it nice and big. In the Rocky Mountains, the Laramide block uplifts, each of these red circles, Colorado, Wyoming primarily, are, what are they? Blocks of the foundation of North America, the old Precambrian North American craton that have been magically lifted out of the ground they not only got to the surface, they've lifted more than 12,000 feet above sea level. Each of these individual block uplifts. It's just like it sounds. A block of basement that's way higher than it should be. It should be down there in the dark. It's not. It's up. That's one way to build the Rocky Mountains. These red things are like, I don't know, let's say you're on a farm. You have a barn. You have a pen, a pig pen in your barn. You have a sow who's sleeping in her pen. A large sow, pig. And then in the farmhouse, you're going to make a bunch of green layers of jello, like Knox blocks, but in these pans, okay? And then you're going to go through the milk house and bring those green layers of jello. I'm just making this up, a hypothetical. And then you're going to make a, you're going to lay all those layers of green jello on top of the sleeping pig until we get those green layers of jello nice and flat right to the top of the pen. And then she wakes up and realizes there's a bunch of flat layers of green jello on her back. 
And she's starting to get up off her haunches and she's starting to shrug these green and she's breaking these layers of green jello and they're opening like a drawbridge. And we can see her back now, a hog back, and we can get her back up above the level of the pen. That's what these are. These laramide block uplifts. I'm off script, apparently. These pigs rising and these drawbridge things, these are the sandstones that are being pushed away to allow this Precambrian metamorphic rock to come to the surface. That's one style of Rocky Mountain uplift. It's complicated. Oh, but there's Rockies in Alberta. There's the Rocky Mountains in Northern Montana, in parts of Idaho, Utah, even down into Northern New Mexico. Are those pigs coming up? No. That's a totally different kind of geology that also is part of the Rocky Mountains. Let's use a different color. I guess green, I don't know why. These aren't pigs. These are lines that are thrust faults. And you'll notice the pigs don't continue up into Alberta. It's just green lines up here. The green lines are thrust faults, and thrust faults are faults that have a low angle to them. And you can shove layers of sedimentary rock up these low angle ramps like a frozen pizza box. And you can take that frozen pizza box and shove it over the one that's above it and below it. And you can get a whole stack of these pizza boxes and eventually build a mountain range, but you're doing it laterally instead of vertically. It's less intuitive. That's called the severe. Did I spell it right? The severe pizza boxes and the laramide pigs coming vertically from below, that's Rocky Mountain geology. It's complicated. Why aren't the pigs up here? Did the pizza boxes happen before the pigs at the same time as the pigs? Why is all this action happening? Why doesn't this continue all the way out to the Pacific Ocean? Why is this Rocky Mountain thing so far inland? This is where the Continental Divide is. It is complicated. All right, well, let's make it as simple as we can, if possible. Our topic tonight, how did the Rocky Mountains form? We're in a time window between 100 million years ago and 50 million years ago. Those are nice round numbers. And this mountain building activity is happening between those two dates. We don't have any Rockies earlier than 100 million years ago. We don't have any Rockies growing or building younger than 50. That's right, the Rockies are dead. The Rockies are not growing anymore. They used to be a very active place with major earthquakes like the Himalayas, but it's not happening anymore. Our biggest earthquakes are not happening in the Rockies generally. The Rocky Mountains are dead. And you're like, hold on now, I was in Jackson Hole last summer and I read that plaque and it said that the Teton Range is really young and it's popping up very, very quickly. You're right. And that is in the Rocky Mountains, but that's not Rocky Mountain geology. That's the basin and range that has crept into the Rocky Mountains. So not all of these places in proper, the Rocky Mountains, are part of our story tonight. But the pigs in the pizza boxes between 150, that is our topic. Okay. Now, if this lecture is working, you're already like thinking about potential ideas that you've read or heard, or maybe you're like organically trying to figure things out right now. I don't know. And I need to lead you. I need to lead you the best I can. And remember, it's going to get wild and controversial, and that's coming in short order. Okay? So what is the... Oh, I'm going to keep this right here. What is the old model then? Devised by people at Stanford University in California that explains those mountains. Well, this is a cross-section. Here's a sunny day. And this is California. And offshore of California, we have the ocean. And offshore of California, we have a tectonic plate, an oceanic plate called the Farallon Plate. I'm talking about the old model, the model that I taught for the first 25 years of my teaching career, because I learned from people 
who used to study at Stanford. So I've been indoctrinated by the Stanford Thos. And it's not just the Stanford people directly, but this again is the, if the, the, the conventional story for why the Rocky Mountains formed, the old model. And it could turn out that that's still true. After all, this, is, all this new data has been processed and discussed ad nauseum. But I wonder, I wonder. Okay, so we have a, this is just like the Andes, isn't it? This is what I just draw at the beginning of the lecture. We have an oceanic plate subducting to the east, diving beneath California. And this nicely explains the coast range of California, a subduction complex or an accretionary wedge, the Great Valley of Central California, a four-arc basin, and then a beautiful volcanic arc, just like the Andes, just like the Cascades in the Pacific Northwest. Heard of it? And those volcanoes have magmas feeding them, and the, the magmas are being generated deep within a subduction zone. This is Geology 101. And the old model to explain the Rockies, which we haven't built yet, devised by people in California 55 years ago, 60 years ago now, 50 years ago. These magmas were active and hot between 120 and 85 million years ago. So to tell the story, the conventional story of how the Rocky Mountains formed, we start with California, we start with the Farallon Plate dipping at a relatively steep angle, generating magmas, and creating the Holy Trinity, the, the California Triad, one, two, three, a beautiful signature of an oceanic versus continental plate boundary. Haven't built the Rockies yet. Now, in this old model, something happens 85 million years ago. And that's because all of these Sierra Nevada batholith rocks solidify. They freeze. And the volcanoes, you've been to Yosemite. There's no volcanoes there. Those are magma chamber rocks. So at 85 million years ago, we shut the whole system off. And that's the data. That's, that everybody agrees with that. So we've locked this system off. It's dead. But the old Farallon plate model says at 85 million years ago, the activity moves east. And guess what we start doing between 85 and 50 million years ago? I should use a different color. We start doing pizza boxes and pigs. And you're like, I don't get it. The Farallon plates over here, what's that got to do with the Rocky Mountain activity way over here in the heartland, essentially? This is Colorado and Wyoming and the Uintas in Utah and Montana. Well, the model says it's pretty simple. Don't overthink it. 85 million years ago, you just change the angle of the Farallon plate. That's all you need to do. Don't make it so hard. Flatten this thing out. Have this Farallon plate continue to subduct. It starts tickling the underbelly of the heartland and it fuels this pizza box stacking. Again, each of these are thrust faults, so we're shoving large section of crust eastward. And I'm not drawing it very well, but I think I tried to give you the visual of these laramide uplifts. And then the whole thing shuts down 50 million years ago, technically 53. 53 is the big number in Idaho and Montana in particular. The whole thing just shuts down. Now, that's what I was teaching. And again, I would have hands pop up. <laughs> the, the, the student faces and names would change from quarter to quarter, but you knew when the same question was going to come up every quarter. Like, why did it stop 53? The Fairlawn play go away? I'm like, eh, I'm not sure. Why did, it, why did it change its angle? 85. What? So each time I would teach it, I'm going, boy, I don't, I don't know about this but yet it remains the majority opinion.
Okay, well, we're to the point tonight where we actually get into some of the good stuff. That was a long buildup to get us there, but hopefully you feel like you're ready now to pounce on what I have for you. All right. I am going to go to my notes and remind myself. Yeah, I'm doing that. So I'm going to turn this one around. I'm going to keep this because we know where we're talking now. And now that we're looking at a cross-section of the Farallon plate with the old model and know that the Farallon plate in this old model has a shallow angle of subduction, or sometimes it's called a flat slab, the flat slab of the Farallon plate. We're going to start talking about seismic tomography and looking deep into the earth, into the mantle of the earth where nobody's ever been, but looking at earthquake waves that are going through that mantle material and seeing if we can find anything down there. And I don't know if you're aware, but we now, using these geophysical techniques, which I know nothing about, but I've met a number of these geophysicists now who are very impressive, so I take their word for it. They can find ocean plates that have subducted. They're still down there. They're still a thing in the lower mantle, in the upper mantle. I wasn't taught that 30 years ago. I was taught that the ocean floor just goes down and it changes state, whatever that means, and it just goes back into the asthenosphere and it's like gone forever. Well, now we can find these slabs, these pieces of the ocean floor. And what's the obvious question? If this model is accurate, let's go find this thing. Let's go find this flat slab Farallon. It must be down there if we can see these slabs. All right. So here's, oh, I need to budget my space here. So here's the old time stick that I used in, uh, for teaching. But on the back of it, I've drawn North America. So this is North America. Seattle is on the West Coast. New York City is on the East Coast. Chicago is about right here. Okay, I'm going to use this. And not bad. Okay, great. It's a cross section. This is also a sunny day. I'll, I'll put it on. Why not? Seattle, New York City. That means this is the Atlantic. And this is the Pacific. Why well, even bother writing? You can't read it. Okay. What does the data say? Can we find this old Farallon plate in the mantle? The answer is no, it's not there. It's not there. Not even, not even a hint of it. And that's new data we didn't have in 1970. Now, if we had that data in 1970, would we have had this flat slab model? Maybe, maybe they would have been just as stubborn and just said, yeah, it doesn't agree with my model. I'm just going to pretend it doesn't happen. I don't know. But we didn't have that data back then. We didn't have the paleomag button. That's a whole other story for tomorrow night. So if we have found slabs, you know what I'm saying, ocean crust that has subducted and is down there, what does it look like? Well, there is some ocean slab that does kind of look like Farallon. That's promising, but I thought I just said it wasn't there. Well, this is way too young and too shallow to be our Farallon from this story. Because remember, this is a story happening between 150 million years ago and truth be told, before that, going back 120, 130, 140 million years ago. So we don't have the sloping Farallon plate that we should have with a drifting, gradually North American plate in a moving trench. We should see just kind of a beautiful angled Farallon slab going all the way down to the lower mantle, and we don't. What we did find 15 years ago, underneath New York City, underneath the east coast of North America, between 1,000 kilometers depth and 2,000 kilometers depth. In the lower mantle, we found this. I'll do it, I'll do it like this. So first of all, 
This thing is super thick. It's five times thicker than it should be. This is what normal ocean crust looks like in profile. This thing is a slab wall, as it's called in the literature, and it's five times thicker than it should be. So the interpretation is this thin ocean crust has somehow folded on top of itself like ribbon candy. My grandma used to have ribbon candy in her parlor. Ribbon candy. And so this vertical slab wall which has no continuation to the surface, it's beheaded, it's been pinched off for some reason, is today underneath the east coast of North America. Now, what's the big whoop? What in the hell would this have to do with the Rocky Mountains? The Rockies are going to be formed up here, right? The pigs and the pizza boxes are going to be happening here. Why am I talking about this so much? This is the key to the story. This vertical slab wall deeper than 100 kilometers depth has to be part of our answer for how the Rocky Mountains formed. You're like, I don't get it. Here's the key. Where was North America 100 million years ago? It wasn't here. You know that 180 million, I've got some images for you. You know that 180 million years ago, Pangaea was a supercontinent and North America was connected to Africa and there was no Atlantic Ocean. And you know, starting 180 million years ago, the Atlantic Ocean started to open. And our friend, North America, started to drift gradually to the West. And this is its present position on the chalkboard. But if we go back to Rocky Mountain time and even setting the table for Rocky Mountain time, we need to have North America back over here. Are you starting to see it now? Our slab wall is part of the old Pacific Ocean floor off the coast of California and responsible maybe for making our Rocky Mountains. Today, it's underneath the East Coast. It's about to head underneath the Atlantic Ocean. But this is old Pacific Ocean floor and the fact that it's vertical is a shocker. Let me add to it. I can feel the energy now. You're, you're right into it. You're locked in and I can tell that this is working for you, I think. Based on detailed geophysical work, we have figured out a sinking rate, an annual sinking rate. So this ribbon candy is still continuing to sink deeper and deeper into the mantle. Don't ask me how they figured this out. 10 millimeters per year. This thing that is folded on top of itself is continuing to sink 10 million meters a year. You're like, big, big deal. Well, can't we go back in time? And if we go back in time, we're not only moving North America back to where it came from, but can't we also then get this ribbon candy straightened out and eventually lay it out where it used to be on the Pacific Ocean floor? The answer is yes, that work has been done. And so now we're not just guessing about an old, what this ocean plate used to look like and what it was doing. It's fricking there. It's not the Farallon, but it's something that was oceanic, that was somehow being subducted. One more point, and then if you're, you're like, get on with it, what is the answer? How does, this, what is, how does this work? I got one more thing for you. Because it's vertical and because it's folded on top of itself, the interpretation is, this is a fixed oceanic trench. This is not a diagonal slab with a drifting continent with a drifting trench. Can you see this? Instead, the only way to make sense of the geometry of this thing sinking vertically and folding on itself is you have to have a fixed location of where the subduction was for tens of millions of years. So that doesn't really work with what we know about North America. We know the journey of North America. It doesn't stop and hang out. North America's edge, and therefore the oceanic trench off the coast of North America, has been drifting. Impossible to explain this. So I don't know how quick you are visually, or maybe you've heard some of this before. But the interpretation, and yes, we're finally there. I'm going to do it verbally. 
Just make sure we don't miss it. The Rocky Mountains, with the new model that I'm teaching, did not form gradually with a changing angle of a Farallon plate. Farallon plate's got nothing to do with it. Instead, North America drifted west and hit a major microcontinent that was fixed out in the Pacific. And the impact of North America running into this thing kicked off our severe thrusts and our laramide uplifts. We have evidence for a collider, something that was in existence out in the water, not moving, an exotic terrain, a big one. We call it the insular super terrain. And North America drifted into the picture, hit this frickin' thing, and pinched off our slab, and it started to sink on its own. So we not only have an ability to go back in time and get this back up into the ocean, but we also have a chance to figure out the timing of when we lopped off the head of this thing. And it works pretty well, more or less, with the land geology that we have and the timing of it. There's a little bit of discrepancy. We got into that this past winter when I was interviewing some of these geologists. Okay, we got there and you're like, I guess, I don't really see what you're saying. Well, let me try to draw it quickly and then, and then we'll go to the slides. What do I need to get rid of? I guess this is going away. Bijou, I'm sorry. So we know this is the old model, it's gone. I don't know, can you visualize something that maybe combines all these ideas that I was trying to pass along? We did it verbally, but I left out a couple of key concepts on purpose. Let's do it very quickly. Let's start. Uh, boat. With the Pacific Ocean, let's have this huge volcanic island arc. Unclear how big it was. Was it just insular? Was it intermontane and insular? Was it a whale? Was it a mega whale? Okay. But it, it's, it's a large piece of land out in the water. And what's beneath it? We have our fixed today, our fixed, this guy, is forming underneath our fixed island arc. This is fixed, fixed trench. We're gonna have a fixed subduction zone trench tied to this fixed island arc out in the water. You're like, I guess, but I don't, I don't, I don't see where this is going. Well, here comes North America. This is the new tectonic model. Not everybody loves it, but I'm a fan. We know North America is drifting gradually. What's the last thing we have to draw? We don't have a big subduction zone at the coast of California. This is California. We don't have a big subduction zone at the edge of California. We have a continuation of continental crust to ocean crust. And what I'm drawing right now is an ocean plate that is subducting to the west and not subducting to the east. This is radical. We're to the radical portion of this evening. There is no Farallon in this picture. The Farallon is gonna be a younger story to explain this. Remember, depth equals time. So the deeper we go, the farther back in our history we go. And we're this far deep, deep in the mantle to get to this time of forming the Rocky Mountains. You're like, I still don't see why you're gonna start forming the Rockies. Well, that's where we need an animation coming in just a second, but can I do it verbally? We're gonna pull North America's continental crust closer and closer to this major microcontinent. How are we gonna do that? We're gonna pull with subduction of an ocean plate. If you talk to any geophysicist, 
they say, why don't regular geologists understand the only reason these plates are moving is you're pulling these continents into a trench. It's slab pull that's motivating these plates. So why is North America even moving west in all your maps? Just because? These are the geophysicists with attitude. They say, you need this westward subduction to get this continent of North America closer and closer. Okay, you need me to finish it, I can tell. So if we pull North America's continent closer and closer, remember this is fixed. This is the insular super terrain or the ribbon continent, which we'll talk about tomorrow night. And we finally do it. We take North America's continent and we collide it at 100 million years ago. This is our collider. We've closed this ocean. We've created some sort of oceanic suture that's still mysterious, hard to find where that ocean closed. But now we're gonna start the Rocky Mountains, severe laramide, get it all going. That's a very different story than the California always Andean story of subducting the Farallon plate. I have to say this and then we're gonna to break to the visuals. This seems almost too easy because now you're saying, can't we go back to the map I'm telling you what you're saying now. So if this is really right, where is this thing that was out in the water? You're saying it added to North America? Well, it depends on where you are latitude. But this is a sneak peek for tomorrow night and paleomagnetism, and Baja BC. The way I'm currently seeing it, and some are seeing it, is that our collider hit here, and then it all moved north. And guess who's in the caboose of this big thing coming from Mexico and coming up to northern Washington, that mountain range right over there, Mount Stewart. So on the most cartoonish, basic level, the devil's in the details, this kind of works, and I thought it was worth your time to explore a few of these ideas. This is a map of the West. Here are the pigs, the Laramide block uplifts, each orange little guy. So Colorado, Utah, etc. Look at the blue going all the way up through the Belt Purcell and into the Canadian Rockies. Those are the pizza boxes. Snake River Plain, a few other things. There's a lot going on with many of these maps done by Robert Hildebrand. Here's another one. Now we're in Colorado and each black is an uplifted pig. Again, this is the Rocky Mountain geology we're talking about. And now you can see some of these, I should use this pointer. Now you can see some of these little black lines here. Oh, you can't see that, that's good. And we don't have our pigs up to the north. I'm still kind of trying to process that, but that didn't occur to me till the last month. Okay, let's try some uh, animations by Tanya Water down in Santa Barbara, California. Uh, here we're showing the opening of the Atlantic Ocean, and I'm just showing you that we know precisely the route, the journey of the North American continent. That's not a guess. So we're not backing away from that. That has to be part of our tectonic explanation for the Rocky Mountains. It's on a loop, right? So we've, we've gotten that. This is like New York pulling away from someplace in Mauritania where uh, Norley is right now. Here's what I used to teach. Big old naked Farallon plate out there off the coast of North America, subducting eastward from a spreading ridge. And these triangles mean eastward subduction to create Andean-like volcanoes, and then if you change the angle of the subducting slab, you make the Rockies. Could, be not, could not be more simple. There are some traditional geologists who say you need this in California, at least for part of the story, because we have blue schists and eclogites that tell us that this eastward subduction absolutely had to happen. But the 
The problem is, depending on which latitude you're at, are you up in BC? Are you in California? Are you down in Mexico? It, the story changes. And so it's difficult to just show one diagram for the entire western margin of North America, I have learned. Again, Tanya. Now she's rifting South America away from Africa, opening the Atlantic. But please note that we have a drifting trench. If we're drifting the continent west, we're also slowly moving the trench. And that does not work with our fixed ribbon candy. I hope you got that point tonight. So here are some of the original sketches from 50 years ago showing the old explanation of the Rocky Mountains. Top picture, Farallon plate, steep angle, subducting to make the Sierra Nevada. Shallow the angle out, and you start making the Rocky Mountains. A more modern version showing something similar. Play with the angle of the subducting Farallon plate and you'll be fine. I wonder how much longer that model will stay, especially if this new set of data gets incorporated into the discussion. There's the globe geography we know. Here's the global geography 180 million years ago. Pangea is going to start to break up, also from Tanyat water. Please note India. Doink, eventually strikes Asia, and we have a continent versus continent collision. If it didn't dawn on you, the new model I've shared with you is a continent versus continent collision. It's the fixed thing out in the water colliding with North America, and there are parallels between the Himalayas today and the new view of the Rocky Mountains, whether you can see it or not at first run here today. Using these isochrons and these uh, seafloor spreading stripes in all the oceans, again, we've, we know precisely the journey of these continents. That's not a question. But again, if we go up to where the subcontinent of India is continuing to plow into another bigger continent, Asia, let's look at it from the side. This is not the Rockies now, but we're looking at the formation of the Himalayas. We close an ocean basin. We shorten the crust. We make thrust faults and reverse faults. Again, we're on a loop. But we're getting away from a tectonic model. I am tonight of a convergent oceanic versus continental plate boundary with the Farallon. And I'm going to something like this. So if we did have mantle tomography showing a steady Farallon plate subducting beneath Western North America, this is what we expect to see then, and we do not see it. It's not there. And these colors with this slab going deeper into the mantle is depth. And de increasing depth or going deeper and deeper means you're getting older and older. So it's basically a way to keep track of time. As you go deeper, you go older in the story. There is something today that has been found. There's Yellowstone National Park over to the west coast of Oregon. And again, there is a slab that does angle. So that's promising. That does kind of look like the Farallon. And in fact, it is the Farallon. But it's too young for our Rocky Mountain story. That's a subducting eastward area that was younger than the Rockies. So here's me saying, what's up with this? We tried verbally in chalkboards. Let's try it now again here. Yeah, we're way the hell down here between 100 and, uh, excuse me, 1,000 and 2,000 kilometers depth in the lower mantle. Our ribbon candy folded on top of each other, vertical. Playground slide, ribbon candy, or whatever you want to call this. So now it gets complicated. I don't expect us to get everything here. I'm not sure I get everything here. But here's North America drifting west. Here's our featured slab wall at different places latitudinally. And I want you to notice up high, westward subduction. Closing an ocean basin between a fixed island arc and a drifting west coast of North America. Another way to show the same thing. And here we're pinching it off when we collide 
at 100 million years ago. Okay, here's what I haven't done with anybody, even uh, from the classroom recently. I've taken these images from Edward Cunette, who's a student of Karin Siglock, and uh, we'll give this a try. I think I'll try it twice. Dates are in the upper left, 200 million years ago. Again, our colors are depth of these slabs, but this is a map now, this is not a cross section. And what we're going to do is we're going to take North America when it first breaks apart from Pangaea and start drifting it to the west. Again, we know that. And I'll try to narrate as we go. I'm advancing with my thumb. Ready? 195 million years ago. 190 million years ago. Nothing happening yet, except we're bringing North America. Uh-oh. Oh, what, what, what? As we get younger and younger we're seeing it's more than one island arc out there. I'm focusing on one major one that we're going to hit, but this model that's been developed has found other ribbon candies at different levels in the mantle. And so as we advance through time, we're seeing first of all that each of these colored lines is a subduction zone. Some of them westward subducting, some of them eastward subducting. Think of each of these as a fixed island arc out in the water. And again, North America is encroaching with each passing slide until we finally start running in to the big one. But there's a couple others that I have to be totally honest, I still don't understand where those rocks are today. Where are those accretions? Are they up in Canada? I'm not really sure. But I'm gonna pick it up now. 100 million years ago, we run into the thing and now I'm hoping you see North America is now drifting over this stuff that's sinking vertically underneath. You're looking through a transparent North American continent. And I know the colors get muddled now. I'm going to do it again real quick. You starting to see it? Can't quite tell from your energy right now. Let's try it again. I'm just going to go faster. It's basically North America is a see-through boat. North America is coming in from the right, drifting over these things that are not moving. Okay, well, I'm going to do it one more time. Now I'm going backwards in time. We're getting back North America back to connect with Africa. Again, this gray, th so this light gray is North America's position today. This dark gray, this black is North America back at the time of this slide. And again, the colors out in the water are these fixed things where the, the, the ocean crest is sinking uh, directly beneath some sort of island out in the water. Here we go. I'll put it this way. If you are familiar with exotic terrains and been taught basics of exotic terrains, pieces of land that have been added to North America, I'm as, just as guilty as the next person. I, I visualize these things coming to us. These, ocean, these islands, these scraps coming from China and everywhere else, they're all just on this ocean conveyor belt coming at us. That's because I was biased by this big Farallon plate coming at us, man. But with the mantle tomography, we need to view the opposite. We're coming to those things. North America's drifting to them. They're like, we're staying out here. You gotta come get to us. We're not coming to you. If you're confused by this, this is a map of North America, but the name Australia put on it. Because today in Australia, Australia is moving north and it is moving north towards a bunch of fixed island arcs that are in the South Pacific. It's a perfect analog to what we're talking about long ago with North America. So these clever map makers are doing this or they're doing this. This is Australia, stamp North America on it, flip it around, have it head towards these things. So these are real maps from the South Pacific, but manipulated to show the relationships we're trying to show today. The point is there are places on the planet today where this is actually happening. Fixed island arcs with moving continents and Ocean plate being pulled 
pulling the continents into the trench. I showed you this last night briefly. I'll show it to you again right now. This is another way to show these fixed colored island arcs and North America, similar to what we were just looking at, plowing in with lots of different geometries, but we're maybe to overload status at the moment. We'll show it to you again tomorrow night because we're moving stuff north. I'm going to finish with a couple other slides and we're done. These are classic cross sections of the Canadian Rockies and the Rockies of Northern Montana. And if you know that area, you know that there's many thrust faults. Therefore, sheets of sedimentary rock stacked on top of each other. You can see they've been folded in places as well. There's no pigs lifting vertically here. This is all this lateral formation. Northwestern Montana, Southern Canadian Cordillera, Central Canadian Cordillera. Beautiful cross sections. From a map view, Bob Hildebrand gives us a map of Calgary. The rock is undeformed. And then here's each of these lines that was drawn on the map showing thrust faults between pizza boxes. Here's probably the most famous of the thrust faults in Glacier National Park, the Lewis Thrust Fault, where Precambrian Belt Supergroup rock has been shoved up and onto much younger rock, Cretaceous rock. And this is repeated over and over and over again in Montana and Alberta. That's one way to build the Rockies. Who's doing the pushing from the left? If you're listening to the lecture tonight, the new model says, who's doing the pushing from the left? The fixed island arc that we slammed into and we shortened the crust that way. So one major question is, once you get into the Burgess Shale and all these other sedimentary layers that are very fine-grained, there's maybe a bunch of details hidden in there that will come up again when studying paleomagnetism. So I'm setting the table for tomorrow night. But these cartoons are now showing westward subduction. And one byproduct of westward subduction, this is going to be complicated and this is backwards on purpose because I want to show you westward subduction. So this is North America, the, the pink is continental crust. This is North America approaching our fixed island arc. And continental crust in geology 101 never subducts, it's too thick and buoyant. But in truth, at the true margin of two continents colliding, especially if we're pulling that continent into the trench, you are pulling the leading edge of that pink continent, that owing corning fiberglass down until it finally breaks and we allow stuff to start falling down. There's slab failure, there's magmas generated by breaking this slab as it goes into a trench, a totally different way to make magmas. Too complicated for tonight, but it's an interesting point. And this is an animation also backwards on purpose to show North America coming in from the right, approaching 100 million years ago. Here comes us, here comes us. We approach 100 million years ago, the leading edge of North America's continent, the navy blue, gets pulled down into the trench. It's continental crust, it doesn't want to go down. But something's got to give. We're going to pinch this thing off. We're going to behead it. That stuff's going to start sinking. And we've got all sorts of complicated geometries at that boundary. I can tell that you like that one. So we're going to look at that again. <laughs> now, you can go too far with this and say, oh, I can see the North Cascades now. I can see all sorts of things going down and going up. I don't even know who made this thing. But to me, there's a couple interesting points. One, the pinching off and allowing this stuff to sink below a fixed trench. But that right there, that boinging back up and lurching trenchward is potentially a very key observation that will be used with bedrock relations in the future with models as they develop. I already looked at that. We're skipping that one. Where is this true suture then between the fixed island arc and North America? Depends on where you look. 
the leading geophysicists combined with Canadian field geologists think that this purple line in the foothills of the Sierra Nevada might be the suture zone. But that's just one group. So that's the hunt right now, is if you want to entertain this westward subduction model, where precisely in the lower 48 are we actually closing that basin? It's not an easy thing to do. I'm giving you the most extreme version. There are models here by Basil Tickoff who wonders if we have both westward, here's our ribbon candy underneath a fixed island arc, but can we also have eastward subduction happening at the same time to please the, uh, the California geologists who want that California triad to work? So can we do both at the same time? And so we finish tonight looking one more time now I'm taking India and Asia label off and just wondering if this is a way to view the Rocky Mountains now. With a couple of tweaks, we need westward instead of eastward. That's a problem. And you know the other problem? I mentioned it quickly before we went to the slides. The thing that collided with us is no longer at the latitude of the lower 48 states. It hits us, and then we got to send India out of the picture to the north as we're looking at it. Rocky Mountains, maybe a new way to look at it. How did the Rocky Mountains form? It's complicated, young lady. Wait till the last week of the class. Thanks for coming, everybody, tonight. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much.